Thank you for coming. We have the pleasure today to have uh, Klaus Rieber from ANU. I'm sure that many of you read his uh, great work. He also extremely lovely guy, one of the nicer in the <laughs> TV. Uh, Klaus did his electrical engineering degree in uh, Adelaide, uh, the University of Adelaide, and then he did his PhD at ANU. And for me, it's always amazing uh, the wide variety of stuff that he did. So he has a lot of publication on surface passivation that I assume that a lot of you read. But he also did a lot of laser doping. He's the co-inventor of uh, uh, sliver solar cells and other same thing. And today, and we are very lucky that now we have collaboration with him on two arena grants. So hopefully we will see much often here. So we have one on the perovskite and one with uh, Alison Lennon on the uh, the Trina project. So today we will uh, Klaus will share some of his knowledge about laser doping. And please welcome Klaus. Okay, thanks, Ziv. I'm very happy that I don't have to sing a song, <laughs> despite all the threats. Um, yeah, and um, thank you for coming to this seminar. So. Um, what I'll be doing today is actually presenting the work of one of my PhD students who is finishing off at the moment, and that's Peter Zhu, so the first name on, on that list there. And um, so some of you would have been here um, a few weeks ago when Andreas Fell from the ANU gave a talk also related to laser processing and laser, laser doping. And um, I think he talked a lot about the characterization and the modeling work that he's done um, and the software, the Quokka software that he's developed. And um, so I'll, today I'll have a slightly different focus, but some of the work that I'll be presenting is certainly drawing on, on that modeling capability to try to extract some of the results. Um, okay, so just to start off, um, the motivation, I'll just go through a bit the motivation of the work. What is it that we're trying to achieve in the end? Where are we aiming for? And then I'll basically talk about um, three areas that um, Peter covered in his PhD. The first one is looking at um, a way in which we can try to characterize some laser doped regions, in particular ways in which we can determine um, the doping concentration that we get from laser doping. Um, and the second area is um, an application of this technique, this, um, this characterization technique, to a particular problem which is trying to figure out what happens at the edges of dielectric windows that you've created with a laser pulse. Um, and the third one, the third area then is to, uh, basically a fairly fundamental look, I think, at um, the impact of different laser parameters and dielectrics on the recombination when you, when you want to do laser doping and um, you create a laser dope region, what kind of damage do you introduce? How does that vary with different laser parameters? what's the influence of the dielectric films. Okay, so to start with the motivation, so if you went to um, Andreas's talk a few weeks ago, you would have seen some of the images that I'll be presenting today. This is kind of probably one of the major um, goals that we want to get out of um, in our laser doping work, and it's extremely challenging. Um, so the idea is um, IBC, in, um, back contact solar cell, everybody knows this is a really nice cell design. It offers very high efficiency potential. And um, so in this case, of course, what we have is we have both polarity contacts on the rear side of the wafer. You can um, perform or you need, you need to have, for the contact regions, you need to have some diffusions. For the emitter, you need to have a, a dope region. And you can perform those, you can create those doped regions in different ways. What we want to do in this process, we want to create all of these heavily doped regions with lasers. But we want to have locally doped regions, so we actually want to keep the doped area fraction as low as we can. Um, so one way in which you can do that is to just have point um, diffused regions, as I've point doped regions, as I've shown in this picture here. Um, you could also have lines, although contacts uh, point regions might be simpler in, in some respects. Okay, so if you've got this kind of concept, um, then um, you need to obviously you need to optimize your, the spacing and the size of, your, of these doped regions. And, but hopefully if you do it and you do it right, you can get um, a high efficiency in the end. Okay, so this is what we're aiming for. Um, and um, so once again, I've lifted this one from Andreas's presentation. 
Um, so this really summarizes um, where you can get to if things go right. Um, so basically what it comes down to with um, these IBC cell concepts is that um, there's basically, in terms of the laser doped regions, there's two parameters that really matter. Um, one of them is the contact resistivity, and the other one is uh, the saturation current density of, these, of, the, of the laser doped regions. So in this simulation here, basically the spacing of the contacts has been optimized for each one of the simulation points. Um, and um, we also, I think in the simulation, Andreas would have assumed a constant size for each of the dots, probably around 20 microns. I'm not quite sure, but there was some, something in that region. So basically a realistic assumption for the size of the contact dots that you can achieve with lasers. Um, so when you look at this graph, what can you get out of it? Well, actually one other thing I should say about this is this is assuming, this is a fairly idealized simulation in the sense that we've basically assumed no other losses except for what's happening in these laser doped regions. So in terms of the front side, the front has perfect passivation. The quality of the silicon is basically as good as you can get it. It's only limited by intrinsic recombination. Um, so it's idealized in that sense, but it gives you a flavor for what you can hope to achieve, and in particular, um, what the impact of um, the saturation current density is. So what you can see here is that if you're looking at 24%, so you're looking at kind of the yellow region, yellow to orange region, then um, you can afford to have saturation current densities around about 1,000 femtoamps per centimeter squared. Um, sorry, not 1,000. Um, um, 10, 10 to the minus 12 amps per centimeter squared. So, yeah, 10,000. Um, yep, yeah, so, and um, what, this, um, what this means is that compared to, um, compared to the kind of saturation current densities that you get with diffusions, you can actually afford to um, have a bit more damage. You can afford for the, um, for the quality of those regions to be a little bit worse by about a fact, by an order of magnitude. So typically if you have a diffused region, um, say 100 ohms per square, somewhere in that region, and infinite surface recombination velocity, then typically you, you can achieve values of around about 1,000 times per centimeter squared or so. Um, in this case, we can afford to have about up, up to 10,000. Okay, so we can afford to have a bit more damage, but there is a limit as to how much damage we can really tolerate. And the contact resistivity, if you look at that, you can see that, well, you can see that all of the lines are pretty much horizontal up to, you know, beyond 10 to the minus 3. So if you've got a reasonable value for the contact resistivity, then it is not a particularly important parameter. So the saturation current density is far more important than its optimization. Um, so um, once again, this is the last one that I'll present for a while that was lifted from Andreas's talk. Um, he, would he presented some results on some initial batches that we made at the ANU um, of all laser doped IBC cells. And um, so you can see here the process, the idea is, so we're still using um, spin on dopants, which might or might not be um, practical if you wanted to do this in an industrial setting. Um, but um, it's a comparatively simple process, but still nowhere near as simple as you need to be to make it an industrial process. But um, there are, so we've, we've got some initial data points, some initial um, reference points in terms of where we can go with this kind of process. And uh, the first batch that we achieved with this process was 19%. Okay, so um, that's the background. So this is where we'd like to get to. We're, uh, one of the main focus areas is these IBC cells. Um, and um, basically what I want to talk about is some of the more fundamental issues that arise when you're trying to make, create these structures. Um, okay, so just to give a bit of background about the experimental side of things. So for the experiments that I'm describing here, it's all um, done with, um, uh, with DPSS lasers or um, other 532 nanometer lasers with Gaussian beam shapes for the most part. And so the setup is fairly simple. It's a kind of a fairly standard setup. Um, we've got um, um, one of the things that um, becomes important later on is for the laser, later on is for the laser, we had two different lasers that we used. One of them was a standard DPSS laser with a fixed um, pulse width of about 20 nanoseconds. The other one is a um, pyroflex laser which allows you to vary the pulse width, the, in other words the temporal pulse shape, and it allows you to, to change um, 
effectively the pulse width in the range of um, less than 10 nanoseconds up to nearly one microsecond. And uh, so this allows you to um, investigate the influence of the pulse length on um, the quality of the laser dope regions. Okay, the other thing that we have in here is we've got some optical elements um, and one of the optical elements that we incorporated for some of the experiments is a beam shaper which allows us to change the Gaussian beam shape to other shapes so we can have a look at that influence as well. Okay, so um, the first topic I want to talk about a little bit is um, when we do laser doping um, normally we want to create, particularly in the case of IBC cells, we want to create localized features. There might be lines or there might be dots. And um, one of the things that we normally would like to know is, well, how much, co well, how much dopant did we incorporate when we made, when we did our, pro our doping process? And how was this dopant incorporated? What's the profile? And uh, this is a difficult question to answer because of the fact that um, laser doping is it's a localized process. The doping is inhomogeneous and quite often we have rough surfaces. So a lot of the characterization techniques that are available aren't great for this kind of situation. Okay, so a couple of the techniques that we can use are EBIC, electron beam induced current, or SIMS. Um, SIMS has a lot of limitations. It's quite expensive. It's slow. It has limited resolution. EBIC can be quite good and um, it, um, it, it it's a relatively simple process, but it still requires you to have an EBIC setup. It requires some specialized equipment, and it requires um, a reasonable amount of sample preparation. So we didn't have EBIC available. We were looking for alternatives, and one of the techniques that we came across, which was already known in the literature, is um, the use of scanning electron microscopy with particular lens and particular um, parameters um, to be able to image dopant density. And uh, so the images that I've shown here are examples of that applied, um, in this case, using diffusions on textured surfaces. And so you can see on the, um, on the left, you can see a, um, a P-diffusion, boron diffusion on an N-type substrate. So you can see that the heavily diffused um, P-type region, in this case, is brighter than the background. On the right, we've got the inverse situation, and you can see that we've inverted the contrast. In both cases, you can see that um, for these pictures, we can nicely see exactly where our diffused region is. Um, and um, so this is, looks quite promising. So um, but then we wanted to know to what extent we can apply this to characterizing laser doping. OK, so here are a couple of laser doping examples. Again, um, p-doping on an n-type substrate and the reverse. And we can see that qualitatively we get similar results. We get this bright image for the p-type doping and a darker image for the n-type doping. And um, we can see, so this is in general agreement with um, other results in the literature where people have characterized these, these dope regions with EBIC, for example. One of the things that you can see straight away is you can see that kind of that Gaussian beam shape reflected in the doping because um, in the center of the beam where you've got the highest beam intensity, you melt the, the melt depth is the greatest and the melt is, remains molten for the longest period of time. So there's the greatest opportunity to incorporate dopant and you get deeper, a greater doping depth and then it tails off towards the end. And it kind of looks roughly like a Gaussian profile. Okay, so that's nice. So we know this, this technique, we can apply it um, to characterizing our um, laser dope regions. Um, we also wanted to know in a little bit more detail about how it compares with other characterization techniques. And uh, Ziv kindly hel helped us here when he was at uh, Ceres and did some EBIC measurements for us. So what we did is we created some sister samples. So we had laser dope lines, we cleaved the sample in two. And we would send uh, Ziv half of these samples and we would use the other half for SEM. And, um, so we can see that in general we've got quite good agreement between the two techniques. So we're clearly picking up the region of the PN junction with EBIC and we can see that reflected in the SEM image. Um, and we can also, one of the other things that we can see in this image though, if you look a little bit carefully, you can see that um, the EBIC line, which delineates the PN junction, 
extends on both the left and the right of the image for quite a long way for this like this very shallow surface region where you still get that EBIC signal. So there's obviously a very, um, probably a very shallow dope region there. And we can't really pick that up in um, the SEM image. So this points to a um, sensitivity limitation of the SEM technique as compared with EBIC. Um, so, and we know from other experiments that um, uh, there is a, both a depth limitation and there is also a dopant um, density limitation which is maybe around 10 to the 18 or high 10 to the 17 per centimeter cube. So anything below that we, we don't pick up very well with the SEM technique. Um, so we could also look at some slightly more complicated situations, on very messy situations. So sometimes laser doping doesn't look as beautiful as what I've shown in the previous images, sometimes it looks pretty ugly when you turn up the laser power. You might not often want to do that because normally the quality is pretty bad as well, but um, it's interesting to see what happens when we try to image that. So um, if you have a look at the images at the top left, then um, one of the things that you can pick up, hopefully, I think it's pretty clear actually, if you have a look at the SEM image, you can see that it's not, um, so a lot of that melt actually got pushed out to the side when we did this, this laser doping. And um, you can see that uh, there's contrast within that melted region, so some of it doesn't seem to have been doped N-type in this process. And um, when we have a look at the EBIC image, now in this case they don't, there's not a perfect one-to-one -one correlation because there's just so much happening on a fairly small um, spatial scale here. But we can see qualitatively we see similar things in the EBIC image. So we can pick up um, a lot of these, these finer details um, with, the, with the two techniques. Um, and once again, the, the bottom image, um, bottom um, right image, um, one of the things, again, we get good qualitative agreement between the two techniques. Um, you probably can't see it very well at the back, but again, there is um, quite a bit of contrast variation within the dope region in the SEM image. And if you were just to interpret, try to interpret the SEM image, you wouldn't be really sure whether all of that melted region was doped homogeneously or not. And in this particular case, EBIC tells us that actually all of that region was doped because we get a nice continuous EBIC signal. Um, so once again, that points to that sensitivity limitation of the SEM technique. Okay, so... Um, SEM, the, one of the really nice things about this technique is that it's um, quite simple. Um, to prepare the samples, basically you simply take the sample and you cleave it. Um, the cleaving process is quite important. You have to try and get a very nice clean cleave. And there are some tricks to do that, which Peter spent a lot of time exploring and, um, and finessing. But um, it's apart from that, once you've done the cleave, you stick it into the microscope and once you know the parameters, if you know the parameters, it's fairly quick to take the image um, and there's no other preparation required. Um, one of the things that we wanted to explore a little bit was um, whether we could use this technique to get a bit more information rather than simply this region is doped and this region is not doped. Um, can we actually get some doping um, density maps from, uh, from, from, this, from SEM, from the dopant contrast imaging? So we did some experiments where we basically tried to correlate um, where we first did some diffusions of various depths and um, then we measured those diffusions with both um, just the standard ECV profiles and with, um, with the SEM and we tried to establish the relationship between the two so we get an empirical relationship and that's what you can see at the top left there and then we applied this relationship to some laser dope regions and in this case, because we wanted to once again be able to independently measure those laser doped regions with another technique, also with ECV, um, we used an excimer laser which gives us very large uniformly doped areas so we can actually do the ECV on them. And um, so what you can see at the bottom is that um, this is just a couple of examples. Um, we can get reasonable agreement between um, the SEM, what the SEM um, tells us, the doping concentration is, and what ECV tells us. It's not perfect, there's a, a couple of funny features here. 
But in principle, um, we think, and this is all for p-type doping, so in principle we think that for p-type doping it is possible to establish a quantitative relationship and to actually get dopant um, density maps from this technique. Um, for, but you need to really be very careful that you're very consistent with the uh, parameters that you use because um, this empirical relationship is very sensitively dependent on most of the parameters um, um, that you use during the SEM uh, imaging. Um, when it comes to n-type doping, the situation is unfortunately much more complicated. In general, it's much more difficult to image n-type doping than it is to image p-type doping. And um, it's not really been possible to establish a quantitative relationship. So it seems that the contrast depends not just on the dopant density, but it also depends on other factors such as exactly where or how deep your dope region is and what that spatial distribution of dopants is. So it, it doesn't seem possible to establish a one-to-one -one relationship. So this is an example of um, an attempt. Yeah, okay. Yep. Okay, so this is an example of an attempt to um, apply this technique then to actually get dope and density maps. Um, so in this case, what we've got is at the top we've got um, a laser dope region um, well, we've got two laser dope regions. There's a couple of differences. The pulse energy was slightly different, but the main difference is the pulse um, spacing. So for the top image, it's 125 nanometers. For the bottom one, it's 500 nanometers. Um, the diameter was, pulse diameter was probably around 20 microns, 25 microns. So in the case of the top image, we had several more pulses in each spot. Right, so we keep on melting and um, solidifying and melting again and solidifying again and doing that many times over. And each time you do that, you give the dopant more opportunity to diffuse deeper into the melted region. So when you just hit the silicon with one pulse, the silicon melts. You've got this dopant which sits in your spin on dopant layer or whatever. And it's got a limited amount of time during which you can diffuse into the silicon. And while it's diffusing, the silicon starts to recrystallize from the bottom as well, of course. So um, very often what happens is that your melted region is significantly deeper than your doped region. But the more often you repeat this process, the more chance you give to the dopant to, to get close to the bottom of that melted region. And so this kind of, these images kind of bear that out. So you can see that when we have more pulses, we get a deeper, more homogeneously doped region um, than when we have fewer pulses. Okay, so uh, the other thing that we wanted to look at was whether we can apply the same technique not just to cross sections but to um, surface, um, to analyzing the surfaces. And um, this was something that actually Peter wanted to spend a lot of time on, but it turned out to be so difficult to do that um, it was only a fairly small part of his work. But um, so I mentioned at the beginning that we have um, um, a, the, op the, the possibility to modify the beam shape in that system. So one of the things that we did was to change the beam shape from a Gaussian beam to a donut shape in this case. So we've got basically a ring of very high intensity and with that intensity then tailing off towards both the inside and the outside and in the middle we have a very low intensity beam. And um, so we wanted to have a look at uh, whether we can see that when we carry out, um, wh when we're doing the profiling Okay, so once again on the, on the left hand side here we've got our SEM image and we can see that we've got a ring shape, which is what we would expect when we have a donut shaped beam. Um, but in this case we also saw that we had a lot of um, um, interesting features within that shape that we weren't really expecting. So we were expecting a fairly homogeneous, fairly homogeneous doping. And this little um, kind of, there's like, you can see kind of like lines going through that pattern and you can see all these, these dots as well. And um, when we had a look, then we went back and had a look at um, the optical microscope images with the spin on dopant still on the, on the wafer, we could see that these features correlate with features in that spin on dopant. So we've got these black areas and we've got also the film seems to have kind of cracked um, during, during the baking process. And, so, and those features are, seem to be quite clearly the cause of the features that we can see in a doping profile. 
And so exactly what's going on with these black dots, I'm not sure, but um, they clearly influence uh, the doping process. So it's from this point of from from the point of view of the talk, it's what's interesting is that we can use this technique to get um, to get quite a bit of detailed information about the doping process and what what is happening and what are some of the non-ideal uh, non-ideal um, things that are happening during the doping. <coughs> okay, so then we wanted to use this and and um, apply this technique to specific issues that we have when we're um, doing our laser doping. Now, one of the specific issues um, that comes up is, um, so at the beginning I, I, had a, I presented the, um, the back contact cell, the all laser doped back contact cell process. Um, what I didn't talk about is that we can do this in two different ways. We can create this cell in two different ways. <coughs> one of them is a two-step laser doping process where we first basically apply our spin on dopant film, so other dopant sources. We dope our um, silicon, and then we remove everything. Then we apply our dielectric film, and then we create the contacts through the dielectric film. And um, that process is obviously more involved, and we have to do an aligned process. We have to align the contact opening to the doped regions, which is um, not very nice for an industrial process. But it's a lot more robust. But in the end, what we would really like is to be able to do everything in one step. So we simply, we have our dielectric in place, we apply any dopant that we need, we do the laser processing, and that gives us the opening and the laser doping in one step. The difficulty with that process is that um, when we do the laser doping, normally the, the laser doping stops at the edge of the dielectric window that we've created. Um, because the dielectric is a, usually a pretty effective barrier against the diffusion of the dopant through the um, dielectric into the silicon. So very often what we get is um, um, doping which looks a little bit like this. So here we've removed some dielectric and our doped region kind of stops sometimes even beyond the edge of the dielectric film. So we can have this region here which has got either no doping at all or only very shallow doping. And that can obviously create problems, high recombination or shunts in our solar cell. And this is really one of the big, big problems that we face when we're trying to implement single, single step um, processes. Uh, the other thing that could happen as well is that we might even have a situation where everything looks fine and we have nice doping underneath our dielectric. But because the heat affected region and the region that, that's kind of affected by the whole laser process extends well beyond the region that's actually doped and well beyond the window of the dielect in the dielectric film, we might still lose the passivation from the dielectric film. So we could have a region further out here where our dielectric film no longer passivates the substrate. So there's a, a bunch of possible um, uh, challenges, possible things that can go wrong that we need to um, get, try to get a handle on if we're going to get this process to work. So, um, so the one, one, of the way, uh, one of the things that we can do then is we can apply this SEM technique to at least see what's happening with the doping at the edges of the dielectric windows. Um, so two ways in which we can do that. One of them is we can keep our dielectric film on the wafer and then actually perform an etching process. So the dielectric acts as a mask. In this case, we used um, TMAH to etch the silicon. And um, so that delineates between the regions with dielectric and regions without dielectric. And when we stick that in the SCM, we can then clearly see where we still had dielectric on the wafer after the doping process. So two examples here. In the top example, um, that's an example of where the doping extended beyond the edge of the dielectric. So you can see the blue lines, blue vertical lines indicate um, where the dielectric film stopped and then the red line um, outlines the doped regions. Um, and in the bottom we've got the reverse. So in this case we can't see any evidence of any doping extending beyond the edge of the dielectric. So both are possible. We can, we can get both situations with different laser parameters and we have to try to find the parameter window that gives us the top situation rather than the bottom. Um, the other way in which we can do this is um, directly by leaving the dielectric film on a substrate and sticking it directly into the SEM. And then what we need to do is we need to be able to actually see the dielectric film in the SEM. 
as well as the doping. Um, and these images look pretty messy and it's actually a pretty difficult thing to do because you need to go to higher magnification when you do this. Um, but in principle, you can do the same thing, you can get the same information. The advantage with this process is you don't need to rely on the dielectric as an edge mask. So if you have a dielectric which is not a good edge mask, you can still apply this technique. Um, so once again, you have two examples here. In one case, it, the doping extends beyond the edge of the dielectric, and in the other case, it doesn't. Right, so we did some experiments where this is a huge parameter space here that you can explore. Um, and um, we, it's actually because this is still quite an involved um, thing to do, to, to do all of these measurements, we didn't get very far in terms of exploring the parameter space, but we had a simple experiment which was basically um, consisted of having a silicon substrate, dielectric, spin and dopant, and then we come along and we do our laser doping and um, we create the doped region and then we try to explore what's happening at the edges and how, how is that affected by the laser parameters. And so in this experiment, what we varied was um, a couple of things. First of all, we had, uh, we had a stack for the dielectric. We had a stack of silicon dioxide and silicon nitride. And we had two different thicknesses of silicon nitride. And uh, then we also varied the laser parameters. So we looked at different pulse energies and, and once again, different pulse distances. So we varied uh, um, the number of times that the laser pulse hits the same area. And um, it's really difficult from an experiment like this to draw general conclusions, but um, we did see a, a definite trend that's obvious here. So what we're plotting in this case is on the vertical axis is the gap distance. A negative distance basically means that the dope region extended underneath the dielectric, so that's what we wanted. Um, so the most obvious trend in this case is a couple of fairly obvious trends there is a difference between the two dielectric film thicknesses. So a thicker silicon nitride film gave us better results. Um, and the other trend is that um, having more pulse overlap was better. So if we wanted to get this, this doping to extend underneath the dielectric, we had to have um, pulses, uh, overlapping pulses. And um, I'm not going to try and explain why those two, what, why, why we see these trends and whether these are general trends or whether they you know, would apply if we used different sets of parameters. Um, because um, really all we have at the moment is guesswork as to why we're seeing the results that we're seeing. But um, it's quite obvious that um, in principle it is possible to get the result that we want. We can get this diffusion, this doping to extend underneath the dielectric but it's also very easy to get the reverse. And if we get the reverse, it's almost guaranteed that we won't be able to make a good cell. So we certainly have to be very careful in choosing our laser parameters. Now, one of the obvious challenges, one of the obvious problems that comes out of this is if we really need multiple pulses to be able to get that doping to extend underneath the dielectric, it's not really what we want if we want a very simple laser doping process. Really, ideally, what we would like is one pulse per region, one pulse per contact. Okay, um, so the other thing that we wanted to look at was um, we did a lot of work in the uh, earlier on in Peter's PhD um, trying to assess the looking at more the electronic quality of these laser doped regions. And we found that it is um, very easy, or most of the time, in a lot of experiments that we did, we just ended up with really, really bad quality. And um, to the extent that we decided that we really needed to go back and try and understand a bit better some of the fundamentals associated with laser doping and the fundamental requirements for achieving good um, quality laser doping. Okay, so this goes basically back to the graph I showed earlier of um, efficiency potential versus saturation current density. Um, so, of course, this graph assumes just now I was talking about some of the problems that you can get at the dielectric window edges associated with chance or high recombination. This graph assumes you've got none of these problems, you've somehow solved all of these, and the only problem you're left with is a problem of recombination in the laser doped silicon. Um, and um, we, so we know from this graph that we can tolerate about 10,000 femtoamps per centimeter squared, 
but we can't afford to be above that if you want to get a reasonable efficiency. Now the problem is that um, in terms of this emitter saturation current density and the laser, process, laser doping process, the interaction is very complicated. There are a large number of factors that influence this J0. So it's dependent on the doping profile that we achieve and it's dependent on the defects, the type and the density of defects that we generate in this process. And both of these in turn depend on all of the parameters that are available to us during this laser doping process. So it's very difficult to deconvolute what's going on. So to try and um, attempt some kind of deconvolution, um, what we did is we went back to an extremely simple experiment, <coughs> which is not going to tell us exactly how to do this laser doping. So it's not going to give us a recipe that we can apply to make solar cells. But what we were hoping for was some guidelines about what we can afford to do and what we can't afford to do when we do laser processing to try to achieve um, reasonable values of J0. So the experiment was basically, we wanted to avoid some of the complications associated with the fact that when you're doing um, laser doping, when you're changing your laser parameters, you're changing the dopant concentration as well as changing everything else associated with those laser parameters. So to do that, what we decided is we get rid of the laser, the doping source, we pre-dope our wafer, we, in this case we put in a boron diffusion, and um, then we um, simply look at the interaction of the laser beam with this silicon substrate, this pre-dope, pre-diffused silicon substrate. And we can then vary the laser parameters and we can see what happens and we can put different dielectric films on top and we can see what happens after that. So the basic experiment is we start off with this structure and then once again we come along with the laser pulse and um, we create an opening in the dielectric and we melt the silicon and we will redistribute some of that um, boron in the wafer. Um, but we know that um, we're unlikely, if we keep our laser pulse energy sufficiently low, we're unlikely to lose much boron. And if we just redistribute that boron, we know that it doesn't actually have much impact on the J0. The distribution itself is not particularly important. Um, so this is uh, the experiment, and before the measurement, when we, when we do the measurement, we remove all of the dielectric film, so we have completely unpassivated surfaces on both the front and the rear. And um, so this keeps everything fairly simple, and basically what we're looking at then is we're looking for an increase in uh, J0 due to our laser process above the J0 that we have on our unprocessed boron diffused um, surfaces, unpassivated surfaces. Um, and so for the analysis we used photoluminescence and we applied um, the Quokka model um, and the, the photoluminescence, the analysis of photoluminescence that's implemented in Quokka. And um, so what I've shown on the left is by the way the process side in this case is facing down because we wanted to avoid any artifacts associated with the changed optical properties. And on the right is just an example of the kind of sample that we have. So we basically created boxes with different laser parameters and each box is about 4 by 4 millimeters and we just l and we create um, lines, laser processed lines with a certain pitch. Right, so it's at least it's a fairly simple experiment. Um, one, of the, one of the disadvantages of this approach is that we have fairly limited sensitivity to um, the J0 of the laser doped region. So because of the fact that our laser processed region is facing downwards and because of the fact that we are already starting with quite a high J0 um, from the unprocessed, unpassivated region, um, we, um, if we, a, a slight loss in the PL signal actually indicates quite a high increase in the J0 of the laser processed regions. Okay, so this is basically our um, the modeling, from, modeling from Quokka which shows us what's happening. And it's really the insight that's interesting. <coughs> We're starting off in this case with a J sub zero of about 2,000 femtimes per centimeter squared. We know we can tolerate up to about 10,000. So in this particular plot where we've normalized everything to the background J naught, we can afford a normalized J naught up to about five. So it's really that region between a PL signal of normalized PL signal of one, which is the PL of our background, and maybe 0.7 or point 0.75, that's the region of interest, so this is what, what we're looking. 
Right, so now I've got a couple of really messy graphs to show you. Um, and if you think this one is messy, wait until you see the next one. But, um, okay, so we did this experiment and then wha what did we get? So um, the first thing we did was we did this experiment with um, no dielectric film. Um, and um, what we varied in this case was we varied the, um, the, the pulse width, laser pulse width. So in this case on the left we've got 20 nanoseconds, on the right we've got 400 nanoseconds. And then once again we varied that pulse overlap. So we've got, we can see in this case, 0.25 microns all the way up to 20 microns. 20 microns is the case where we've got individual pulses, so there's no overlap at all. Um, right, so what can we get out of these graphs? So first of all, let's look at the red line. So this is the actual J0 lines. The black one is kind of a separate experiment. Um, well, we can see one of the things that's encouraging is if we're looking at the, um, the left graph, we can see that we've got a reasonable region here where our normalized J0 is pretty much one. So we've got this region here where our laser process doesn't introduce any additional damage. That's what we'd be hoping for. And then as we go to high energies, well, things go pear-shaped. Okay, except for this one data point here. Um, and if we now vary the pulse width, so we go to 400 nanoseconds, first thing is that if we, vary if we increase the pulse width, we can absorb much more energy. Um, so in this case, our pulse energy is much higher. And we can see that we've, in this case we've got a somewhat broader window in which to do our doping. And once again we've got a, this window where we can maintain um, a J node which is close to one. So really no significant damage introduced through the laser process. So that's kind of nice. There's a couple of other things that we can see here. One of them is that in general doing multiple pulses in the same spot actually doesn't degrade that area. Um, so it's not like there's kind of a cumulative defect generation process that happens, so every pulse you generate more defects. That doesn't seem to be the case. Um, so that's, that's kind of nice to know as well. The black lines here were basically a separate experiment where we wanted to calibrate, we wanted to get some sense for how much doping we can actually introduce with each of these laser parameters. So basically, um, where, where these black lines, these black dots, um, uh, below about 100 or so, that's really the region where, in where we're interested in. Okay, so we can actually relate this, and I think I'm running out of time, so I'm going to have to skip a few things, but we can try to relate. One of the things we can do is, if we look at this area here where the J node suddenly increases, we can ask why that happens. And if we do some modeling and we try to figure out where the evaporation threshold is, where's the point at which we start to actually lose a significant, significant amount of silicon due to evaporation, um, we can get this kind of graph here. So we've got pulse duration on the, on the horizontal axis and the pulse energy on the vertical axis. And these colored bars here, the top of these colored bars is basically where we start to see significant damage from our J0 um, calculations. And we can see that basically, in all cases, the point where we start to see substantial damage is sort of roughly equal to the evaporation threshold. In, in the case of this graph, it's actually above the evaporation threshold, but I think the error in these calculations is probably significantly, um, sufficiently large that I wouldn't be confident that it's, it's probably within the error of those measurements. So we think that Basically, the damage is correlated with the onset of substantial evaporation and loss of silicon. And um, when you get that evaporation, um, you also start to really move that melt around a lot and um, you, you no longer have a nice, smooth laser doped area. Okay, so, yeah. So I'll give you a minute to memorize this and then I'll ask you some questions on it. Right, so what we did is um, we applied dielectric films and we went through the same process. Of, and um, so what can I tell you about this? Let me try to summarize. Um, the first thing, and maybe well, I can try to point it out in the graph. So these lines up here, that's silicon nitride. And here as well. Okay, 
uh, was actually we used different kinds of silicon nitride film. So silicon nitride turned out to be really bad in terms of it introduced a lot of damage into our laser dope regions. Um, when we used um, the other one, the other lines that we've got here are for silicon dioxide. We used other dielectrics as well. We used aluminum oxide, titanium dioxide. They all behave similarly to silicon dioxide. So other dielectrics produced much less damage and we actually have a reasonable region where we can still keep that damage to within reasonable bounds. Um, so one message is that the dielectric film that we use really matters in terms of the damage that we introduce to the laser dope region. Um, the other one is that um, whenever we use a dielectric film, even in the case of silicon dioxide, we do seem to cause some degradation compared to the bare silicon case. Um, and it seems to be particularly the case that what sometimes seems to happen is that we kind of reduce that, that window that we have in terms of the pulse energy, the range of pulse energies that we can apply while keeping the damage within reasonable bounds. So we've got a narrower window when we apply dielectric films. Um, so, yeah, so in general there's some, um, it's certainly by no means hopeless, but what's pretty clear is that because of the idealized nature of this experiment, for cases where we can't get a good result in this experiment, it's extremely unlikely that when we applied it to a much more complex doping process with the same kind of dielectric film and the same kind of laser parameters mm. that we would be able to get acceptable results. Okay, so um, the last thing that I will probably not have time to talk about, but we also performed then some annealing experiments because when you get a bad sample and you don't know what else to do with it, you anneal it. So. We did some annealing at 600 degrees, 30 minutes, which is kind of a typical anneal, and it has been reported in the literature that you know, various people have observed that annealing often really helps to recover laser process samples. And um, we did indeed see that there was a significant improvement in, um, in, the, uh, laser, in, in the quality of these, a lot of these laser doped regions. Um, so even after the annealing process, silicon nitride samples were still significantly worse than, film, than samples with other dielectric films. But um, the basic message is that um, the, it is possible, it's certainly possible to choose windows, parameter windows, where you can keep this damage to reasonable levels. Um, and the second message is that annealing does, if you can afford to do it, so if your so dielectric film um, can withstand the annealing process, then it is um, very beneficial to do so in most cases. Um, okay, so I think I'll probably skip over these. That's just the detailed anneal results. Okay, so basically that's what I wanted to cover. So in conclusion, um, well, really what uh, a lot of the work that I've presented is about trying to implement a single step laser doping process. It is very challenging. I think we're nowhere near that, that goal. Um, but at least we've got a nice tool that we can use to analyze what's happening in terms of the doping. So this SEM technique seems to work very, very nicely. We know that we can get good doping underneath the dielectric if we choose our conditions right, but it's not a huge um, parameter window that you have. And um, we know that we can keep this laser induced damage to acceptable levels, even when we have multiple pulses in the same spot. Okay, but we need to do a lot more work to understand what's really happening in these dielectric edge regions, so we've barely scratched the surface in terms of that. Okay, so that's, with that I, I want to finish and I just want to thank, um, first of all, my colleagues at ANU who've really um, done a, a lot of work um, in, this, in this field and, and contributed to, this, um, to the results in this talk. Also the colleagues at, um, at ESA and at ISFH that we've been working with on a couple of projects. And uh, finally, ARENA for funding through um, one of the, um, a project grant which is uh, related to this work. And uh, thank you for your attention.
So Klaus, the conclusion about the different film, is it because of the thermal coefficient? That's gave assumption about the different between silicon nitride and all the other things? No, I don't know. I don't know. It's, it's um, yeah, we do not know at this stage. One of the things that we could see sometimes with the silicon nitride in the SEM in images is um, there seem to be some like little particles or something in the melted region. So we think that maybe there is some precipitates, there are some precipitates or something like that. But we can't rule out that it's mainly due to thermal stress as well. Is the silicon nitride is with your PCVD or the low pressure? Um, this was mainly PCVD. I think they were all PCVD films. So I only showed one, but we actually tried, we used several different recipes, several different refractive indices. Yeah. Um, first of all, thanks a lot. That was a really interesting talk. I um, just wanted to ask you about the, the validity of your assumption with um, doping profile of your boron diffusion and how that assumption, the, the assumption that um, the doping profile doesn't affect too much the recombination due to laser doping. Mm -hmm. Just wondering if you could elaborate on the diffusion profile of boron and, and the laser melt depth. Um, okay, so yeah, one thing I didn't mention is that the fusion set we used were I think around about 70 ohms per square in that region. And the profile, I mean, they were, we just used the boron um, diffusion tube, temperance diffusion tube for that. So I don't have the, the actual profiles here. Um, basically, the reason why I said that is because um, if you um, if you look at the literature, or if you, even if you just perform some simple modeling with PC1D or other program, and you, you just put in, you, 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 um, you use different profiles with the same total amount of boron, what you find is that in general it's, it's quite insensitive. The J0 from these regions is quite insensitive to the actual profile. In general, if you make the profile a little bit deeper, um, the J0 goes down a little bit, but it's a pretty minor effect. It's typically in the order of 10% or so. So, um, yeah, so that's why. So in the context of the kind of changes that we're looking at here, that variation is quite small. So in that case, would you be assuming that most of the laser damage is near the surface and not, not um, past the, the, the boron diffusion or sort of within the, the tail of the boron diffusion? No. Would that be right? Oh, okay. So you're thinking there might, you might get some, if the melt is deeper than the boron diffused region, that the damage could be in that region. Yes. Um, so I think from other experiments, it actually seems that it's, it's that the region, the deepest region is actually the highest quality region. And so, for example, we've also done some experiments where we don't, we don't have any dopamine there at all. We simply melt and recrystallize. And um, so there's um, some experimental evidence that um, actually that region is quite, the, the quality is pretty good usually. Um, the other thing that we did here as well, which I didn't show, is we did try to actually see whether we can fit J0 to our um, recombination results. So we did the PL at different intensities, try to see whether it actually fits a J0 or whether um, if we had significant recombination in the undoped, undiffused region, then of course it wouldn't follow J0 behavior. In general, the results that we got showed a pretty nice J0 behavior. So we think that really most of the damage is in the diffused, in the heavily doped region.